Okay, so this is now uh, Tuesday, September 12th, and this is a meeting of the Ji Jong Bosal Book Club, and we're discussing a uh, very interesting book, um, The Making of a Savior Bodhisattva, Di Zong in Medieval China by Zhi Ru Ying. And uh, before we start the class itself, we will first um, I'll share my screen and we will uh, do a uh, chanting of the Ji Jong Bosal chant together.
吉祥菩萨，吉祥菩萨，吉祥菩萨，吉祥菩萨，吉祥菩萨，吉祥菩萨，吉祥菩萨，吉祥菩萨，吉祥菩萨，弥勒佛。Okay, now I know that um, uh, Joe had a question, but before we get to Joe's question, I want to answer a question that was uh, raised um, last time we met by Camille, who isn't here um, tonight, but I'm still going to answer her question anyway, which is about the um, a translation uh, of the chant. And uh, to answer that, I'm going to share my screen again. So this is in the... Uh, <clears throat> And we're now looking at the mindisbuddha.org uh, blog uh, site. This is the post that's on that blog about Jijang Bosal chanting the text. And so I've added um, the English translation of the first four lines, which is really just the names of, of Jijang Bosal or, or some of the names of Jijang Bosal. I still need to add, I just realized as we were chanting, I still need to add a translation of uh, the last part here, which is a, a, a quote from the Avatamsaka Sutra. I, so I have that elsewhere on the blog, but I, I want to add it to this post as well. And, and um, then here for a more detailed um, look at at uh, at translating um, these four the first four lines. Uh, there's another blog post which is on the names of Jijang Bosal. So if you go to the search function works pretty well on this blog. If you say Jijang, if you just search for Jijang in the blog, there's a little search field, and you um, names of Chitti Garba Jijang Bosal Jizo Dizang. Uh, this goes through these Nambang, Huaju, Yu Myung Goju, and Daewon Bonjon and kind of gives a more blow by blow um, translation of the uh, the Chinese characters. And um, 
let's see. I think there was one other thing I wanted to say about, uh, but now I can't remember it. Um, oh, yeah. So there is one other thing I want to say about uh, the uh, mindisbuddha.org website. If you go here, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, and I'll put a link to this uh, in the uh, description of the video when it gets posted to YouTube. I'm now working on getting a more uh, <clears throat> complete uh, list of all the slides and all the recordings for for this class, the Jijang Bosal Book Club, as well as the other two classes that I'm teaching. So you can find it. You can kind of find everything on YouTube as it is right now. But this might be a this might be a little more um, efficient. And then one thing that has been requested is to provide uh, PDF versions of the PowerPoint slides so that you don't need to have uh, PowerPoint installed uh, on your phone or your computer in order to be able to look at the slides. So I'm going to work on that too. Um, and now I think there is, I think Joe had a question he wanted to ask. Um, I'll stop sharing now. Yes, Kurt. And thank you for the PDF. Uh, yes. Uh, I already used the one from uh, last week, so that was great. Oh, yeah, right. Uh-huh. So, yes, my question is, uh, when I started reading Chapter 2 of the book, um, it seemed like the author jumped uh, immediately <laughs> into the, uh, the uh, Sanjay Chao um, yes. group, group, and... I immediately thought it was something that I had um, had not remembered yeah. or maybe had missed or, or read too fast over it. Um, and it caused me to go back and then begin looking. Um, yeah. and, and I could never really find anything. So right. I was at a loss. And, and so I wanted to ask, is that something I had missed in a previous chapter or, mm -hmm. or not? Yeah. Um, so let me share my screen again. I'm going to look at the electronic Okay, here, here. So here we're looking at the um, chapter that we're going to be talking about tonight and that Joe is just referring to, Chapter 2, Cultic Beginnings Reconsidered. Um, and here she mentions uh, Sanjay Zhao. And so I can go and, well, I don't even need to copy it. I can just go up into the search. Since this is, this, since this is an electronic version, a PDF, um, I can search for uh, Sanjay and I can go search back and so there is some mention of it here just kind of at the very last paragraph uh, of the uh, introduction uh, so she mentions it a couple times uh, here and there uh, but there is in fact uh, yeah let's see Sanjay Joseph's appearance Yeah. So, um, so prior to its being mentioned at the beginning of chapter two, she has mentioned it a few times, but there's no point in the book where she says, oh, here I'm going to explain to you what Sanjay Zhao is, or there isn't like an appendix or a glossary that explains, you know, terms or anything like that. And uh, so her audiences for this book are, um, you know, Buddhists in general, people who like to read books about Buddhism who are interested, but a, a, pr a primary audience for her book is an academic audience, people who they either already know what Sanjay Chow is or won't admit it and go look it up themselves, <laughs> pretend that they know it, or they say, oh, I guess I should know this. Um, but, and it is a for people who study this period of Chinese history um, or this period of Chinese Buddhist history, um, Sanjay Chow, people know about it. Um, but if you're just one of the good things about this book is that it brings up stuff um, uh, to go find out about. Uh, it doesn't always do a great job of providing that background information. That's one of the main things I hope to do um, tonight. Um, and so uh, any any other, so my, I mean, and she did mention it a few times before getting to there, but she didn't explain what it was. And she doesn't really explain what it is, or what it was. Um, in the book it's not right and even in chapter two she gives you some little pieces mm -hmm. uh, about it but mm -hmm. um uh, not not too much though yeah yeah 
Right. You know, it's a typical thing of it's beyond the scope of what she's, you know, attempting to do in the book. She's just assuming the people will go and find other things about Sanjay Zhao. Uh, so, any other questions? Um, no? Elizabeth is shaking her head. All right. So, um, we will be getting to Sanjay Zhao very soon. Uh, I'm going to continue sharing my screen here. I'm going to bring up this uh, PowerPoint presentation. Let me see if I can figure out where to start. All right. So here I am uh, starting. And so these are the, uh, the first couple of slides might be familiar if you've uh, photographically uh, mem remembered um, the presentation from three weeks ago. Um, and one thing that's a consequence as a consequence of um, the month of August having had uh, five Tuesdays in it. It's been three weeks since we last met. Um, so your photographic memory might be fading. Um, so I'm going to, uh, let's see. So let's just start where Jiru Ng starts um, at the beginning of this chapter. Um, we'll talk more about what she means by cultic beginnings reconsidered. Um, but the very, she dives right in to this business. Modern scholarship attributes the initial dissemination of the Dizong cult to the teachings of the three levels, Sanjay Zhao, and cites Longmen sculptures and inscriptions as examples of Dizong worship in the seventh century. That's on page 50 at the very beginning of chapter two. And then, uh, spoiler alert, uh, by the end of the chapter, uh, 27 pages later, um, the Zhiruing is prepared to caution us that one must be wary of attributing the rise of, D of the Dizan cult solely to Sanjay Zhao activities. And also it is probable that Dizan piety existed in the seventh century as one of several uh, growing modes of Buddhist devotion prior to its association with Sanjay Zhao. And here, this is my, uh, this is my emphasis here. This is uh, her emphasis here. Um, so these are what we're going to talk more about what this is all about um but so what but aside from the historical background uh what is uh the author trying to do in this chapter um and uh, to address that first of all we kind of have to look at what does she mean by cultic beginnings okay which is what she titles this chapter uh she wants to draw our attention to a fact and it's an important distinction to make uh that just because um, you find the name of a Buddha or a Bodhisattva uh, in some sutra, uh, you know, so we know that this Buddha or Bodhisattva exists. There are hundreds and hundreds of these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and even thousands, really, if you were to go through um, all of the different lists and all the different sutras. Um, uh, so that's one thing, you know, for these beings to be exist, to, to exist and be acknowledged um, in, in the Buddhist um, religion. Uh, uh, broadly speaking, uh, but what does what happens is that uh, certain Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, in particular, become a special of, of special po focus in the way that people practice Buddhism. So it's no longer just a, a, a question of you know people who are part of the cast of characters in the in the sacred texts of Buddhism. The s certain Buddhas and Bodhisattvas become much more prominent in the actual. Uh, practices that Buddhists, both as, as, as individual Buddhists and as groups of Buddhists um, um, practicing together, um, uh, particular Buddhists and Bodhisattvas become more prominent in, in their practice. Um, and so, especially going back over a thousand years, we can't see into people's heads and hearts. So we can't know who people are holding, especially importantly in their heads or in their hearts oh you know i i really think avalokiteshvara is wonderful or whatever we don't know what people are thinking or feeling uh, about particular buddhas and bodhisattvas so we can look at evidence you know material evidence that survives from things that have been written um and also things that have been made uh that reflect people's practices so things that are written are either texts that describe uh, uh, 
uh, what people practice. You know, so, so sometimes the text will be uh, describing, oh, these people were doing such and such a practice. Uh, other times the texts in question will be more like actual instructions. This is what you should do. Um, and so in addition to uh, written evidence, either describing uh, what people do in their, in their uh, practice of Buddhism or instructing people what to do, uh, in their practice of Buddhism. We also have uh, physical objects, uh, pictures that are people hang on their walls or put up on their altars, statues that people, you know, put on their altars or in some other important place um, as, a, as, a, as part of their practice of Buddhism. Um, and in and other forms of artwork um, that people might have, all of these kinds of, of uh, uh, tangible artifacts artifacts uh, can be um, uh, evidence. Uh, and using this kind of evidence, we can build up an image of, you know, what, what Jiru Ng and others would call a cult for a particular Buddha or Bodhisattva, in this case, Dizong. Um, and so when we go back and look through the historical record, we look at things that have been written, we look at artifacts that have been dug up or found, um, uh, we can say, well, when did texts describing or instructing practices involving Dizong first appear in China? When did images of Dizong um, and, and pictures of Dizong and other um, you know, tapestries or whatever, uh, when did they first start appearing that, that we know of? Now, there may be older ones that are lost um, that we don't know about, but uh, when, do, when do we first have evidence of them um, appearing and this gives us evidence of when did people first start doing these kinds of of, of practices associated with uh, Dizong. Um, now as we do this at least in my opinion this isn't what um, this isn't from Zhuo Ying this is coming from me uh, it's important to keep in mind the limitations of approaching Buddhist practice through the lens of cultic practices quote unquote. Um, for example people who chant the Heart Sutra or chant the Great Durrani, or chant Kwan Sin Bosal chanting, don't necessarily think of themselves as belonging to an Avalokiteshvara cult, right? Um, uh, they, they just think of themselves as Buddhists, and they just think of those practices as normal Buddhist practices, uh, not as some special cultic practice. And so we have to be a little careful about the, this terminology. At the same time, though, it would be interesting uh, if we were, if you know, a thousand years ago, people were studying Buddhists living today, they would be very interested to know, well, did they, uh, not necessarily did they consider themselves to be part of an Avalokiteshvara cult, but did they do? Did they chant the Heart Sutra? Did they chant the Great Durrani? Did they chant Kwan Sin Bosal? Did they have pictures of, of Avalokiteshvara or Kuan Yin or Kwan Sin Bosal up on their walls? Do they have statues of, of Kuan Yin on their altars? This, this would be an interesting thing for people who are, you know, studying us <laughs> uh, a thousand years from now. They would be interested in knowing that about our practice of Buddhism. What was Buddhism like uh, for these people? Um, and so that would be, whatever they call it, they could call it, they could say, oh, these people were members of the Avalokiteshvara cult. Um, well, fine, but uh, we should recognize that uh, that's a somewhat artificial label that's being put on, on us or on them in this case. And another problem with looking at it uh, with using this kind of terminology is that there can be a tendency to view cults like this as being rival cults competing for people's uh, allegiance or loyalty. Um, and with some notable exceptions, which I'll talk just a little bit about, this is not the case. You know, uh, first of all, all Buddhists uh, obviously revere Shakyamuni Buddha. So Shakyamuni Buddha isn't competing with these other Buddhists and Bodhisattvas that, that appear um, for um, people's loyalty or reverence or, or belief or prayers. Um, in fact, all of the other Buddhists and Bodhisattvas that Buddhists do revere, uh, we know about and are directed to revere them through the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha. He's the one who's telling us about these uh, other Buddhists and Bodhisattvas for the almost, yeah. I mean, that that's, that's where our ideas, uh, our knowledge of different Buddhas and Bodhisattvas come from is from the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha. Um, so right from the very beginning, we know that there is not a, you know, it's not a, a, a zero sum uh, competition um, <clears throat> for our allegiance. Um, 
And just some examples in the Lotus Sutra, which is taught by the Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha. Uh, it's one of the main teachings that encourages homage to Avalokiteshvara. Uh, but in that same sutra, there's also lots of other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who are talked about and, and shown respect and uh, uh, held up as examples and as great teachers. Um, in another sutra, in the Kshidigarbha Sutra, uh, which obviously is central uh, to um, the cult of Shidigarbha, if you want to call it that, um, the longest chapter in that sutra is devoted to Avalokiteshvara. <laughs> so it's not a, uh, yeah, okay. It, it, it's not a competition. Now, I did say there's some notable exceptions. There are um, a teachings associated with some pure land groups and teachers that discourage uh, uh, any kind of emphasis being placed on any uh, other Buddha or Bodhisattva besides Amitabha. And, and there, uh, sometimes you will hear from people who are very serious and, and, and sincere um, Pure Land uh, practitioners and teachers. They'll say, well, it just makes people uh, uh, confused or it kind of, you know, it, it, it dilutes your attention. If you have too many Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, you should just focus and concentrate on Amitabha. Um, and, and one thing that's interesting is that in the uh, Chittigarbha Sutra, uh, there's a whole chapter on uh, uh, the names of Buddhas. I forget what chapter number it is, but there are 19 different Buddhas uh, that are uh, mentioned in that chapter. Um, <clears throat> and uh, at the very end of the chapter, it says, if reciting the name of one Buddha is of great benefit, then how much more beneficial is it to recite the names of many Buddhas? So that's basically the opposite of what some people say <laughs> when they say, oh no, you should just focus on Amitabha or maybe just focus on one. Um, but, uh, you know, Buddhism, an ancient Buddhist teaching is different strokes for different folks, you know? So it's all good. All right. Now, in Buddhist devotional art, it is often the case that prominent Buddhists and Bodhisattvas are depicted in groups. Um, this is a this is a thing. Um, Dizong is often uh, portrayed along with other Buddhists and Bodhisattvas. Uh, groups of three are especially common. Um, <clears throat> with the triad of uh, Amitabha, Mahastama Prapta, and uh, uh, Avalokiteshvara. This is the most common of these groups of three that you'll, that you'll encounter. Um, yeah, anyway, Mahastama Prapta is one of the eight great bodhisattvas. So that's another group, the eight great bodhisattvas. There's also four great bodhisattvas, which uh, Mahastama Prapta didn't make the cut. He's not one of the four great bodhisattvas. But um, So there's lots of these groups, and so the, the, there is no... Um, the point about these groupings is that they should make it clear that bodhisattvas, far from competing for loyal followers in some kind of bizarre, dharmic, zero-sum game, are instead involved in what is a collective effort of all bodhisattvas working together for a common cause, the liberation of all sentient beings, which is, to state the obvious, just Mahayana Buddhism 101, you know, I mean, that <laughs> should be obvious. All right. Uh, but, okay. So that was all kind of an asterisk next to this phrase, cultic beginnings or cultic practices. Um, oh, here's a typo I need to correct. So when do we first see clear, evi clear tangible evidence of Buddhist practitioners paying special attention to Dizong in particular? So this is a legitimate question. Regardless of, of the terminology that we use, it's an interesting, you know, legitimate question to look at. Um, uh, so she uh, makes a point, Zhu Ying does, of uh, combining this question with the closely related question of what is the relationship between Dizong and the Sanjay Zhao school? Okay, so we're getting to Sanjay Zhao now. Uh, and she does this because many scholars have previously attributed, and this is in her words, attributed the initial dissemination of the Zizong cult to the teachings of Sanjay Zhao. Uh, much of Chapter two is devoted to demonstrating that things are not quite so simple as that. So she wants to look at this idea that, oh, uh, Dizong first appears uh, <clears throat> as an object of, of special veneration and attention and focus and in people's practice uh, because of the teachings of the Sanjay Zhao school. Okay, so, well, what is this Sanjay Zhao school? Uh, and in looking at what the Sanjay Zhao school is, we'll find out more about what their relationship with Dizong 
uh, is. So the Three Level Schools was founded by a very interesting guy, uh, Xing Jing, um, who uh, died at the very end of the 6th century. Um, it, it, he, uh, and so he is, fortunately, many of his writings uh, survive. We can look at it. So we don't have to wonder uh, what did the, what is the three levels? Xing Xing himself tells us what the three levels are. Um, and they are three levels of practitioners, uh, the highest level, the middle level, and the lowest level. So the first, second, and third level of practitioners. Um, and so he gives some specifics that are a little strange, um, having to do with who, whether you can practice in quiet places or chaotic places or, or whatever. But the, the real point of the, so the three level school is often also referred to as the third level school because the teachings of Sanjay Zhao are specifically um, focused on this third level, the lowest level um, <clears throat> of people, uh, the uh, uh, practitioners who have wrong views um, and who are not suitable to stay at ease uh, in quiet, remote mountains for whatever reason. Um, it was an important distinction uh, for, well, and so oh, the even though this is a, a bit strange of a distinction, the important thing is that there's a great emphasis in Xing Jing's uh, teachings and Sanjay Zhao in general on co work on group practice. Um, because people can't be trusted to go off and practice by themselves because we're so deluded. Um, now, this, these three levels correspond to three levels of practitioners, the highest level practitioners, the medium middle level practitioners, and the lowest level, the most, the, the, the people who uh, uh, have the least going on in terms of their understanding and ability, uh, understanding of the Dharma and ability to practice the Dharma. Um, but, uh, let's see. Okay, so now I'm going to see. So the, the, I'll, I'll get back to this point, but it's important to know that these three levels also correspond to three periods of time. And the f first level when there were most people were on the highest level. This is people who lived at the time when Shakyamuni Buddha lived or immediately thereafter, uh, when the teachings of the Buddha were being given directly by the Buddha or were remembered very well immediately after the Buddha's death. People in the second level were those who lived a while later when people were beginning to forget uh, the teachings and we're starting to make more mistakes in their understanding of the teachings and the third period which Xing Jing was convinced had been entered into by humanity was a period when m the Buddhist teachings had for the most part been forgotten uh, very little was remembered it was still p possible to practice the Dharma but very very difficult um, because the teachings had mostly been forgotten in the third period okay uh, but before, it, it, one thing, why? Why did Ching Jing believe that uh, he was living in what uh, people came to call the Dharma ending age? Or usually it's not just referred to as the, the Dharma ending age, but in the evil Dharma ending age. Um, and you might expect that uh, this kind of, well, let's see, how am I doing on time? Actually, it is, so this is a good, Good stopping point. We will start talking about what is the evil Dharma ending age. Why did Xing Xing think that he was living in an evil Dharma ending age? And what kind of a world did Xing Xing actually live in? Was it an evil, an, an you know anti dharmic period or not? Um, all these questions and more will be answered um, after this uh, after this break. So I'm going to let's see now. Yeah. So we'll take a five minute break now. As soon as I can get up. Okay, there's the book. And where's my timer?
Okay. So, any any questions so far? If not, I'll just plow right on in. Okay. Now, <clears throat> and this is more that uh, Zhuring doesn't really get into, um, but it, when when you might expect that uh, the Dharma ending age <laughs> would be a bad time, an evil time. Uh, perhaps a time when there was uh, uh, social, political, and cultural turmoil. Now, there was actually quite a bit of... Uh, so th th this is the time that uh, Jing Jing lived, and the time when the Sanjay Jiao came into existence, was actually towards the end of the Northern and Southern Dynasties period. Um, if you go back to the previous slides where there had, I had several slides on, on uh, different periods of Chinese history. Um, uh, so there, there was a, uh, this was coming towards the end of a time uh, when China was split in two between the Northern and Southern dynasties. Um, but that period was coming to an end. Um, and so the turmoil <clears throat> well, that, that happened during this time was actually the, uh, uh, the reunification of China which occurred in the Sui dynasty beginning in 581 um, to 618, and then uh, followed by uh, almost three centuries of the Tang dynasty. And so uh, this was not a time of the decline of the Dharma in China. <laughs> this was actually a time of a great flourishing of the Buddhist Dharma in China. And in fact, the early Tang dynasty, which is when the Sanjay Zhao uh, movement was at its height, um, uh, is considered to be the golden age of, of Buddhist Buddhism in China, and it's considered to be the golden age of Chinese civilization uh, in general. Um, and so, you know, now it wasn't only Sanjay Zhao um, that, that had this idea of that there was something deeply wrong with the Dharma uh, in China. This is also what Bodhidharma Sought, thought. <laughs> Bodhidharma lived during this time. And so actually the fact that uh, Xinjing, uh, Bodhidharma, uh, Xuanzang, the famous Xuanzang of the Heart Sutra, Zhi, the guy who wrote the Four Great Vows, uh, Fa Zhang, who is one of the uh, great teachers of the Huayan school, school of Buddhism, all these people lived during this time. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so the, the, Dharma, the Dharma was doing pretty well. Uh, and um, uh, I'll have more to say about Bodhidharma and Zen in a minute. Um, but uh, so the, the Bodhidharma actually came to China uh, during, during the, uh, uh, the time when, when China was still split between the Northern and Southern dynasties. And he visited uh, Emperor Wu of Liang, who was the emperor of the, of the Southern uh, Dynasty. Um, and uh, the way that the Zen school generally interprets um, uh, Bodhidharma's interaction with Emperor Wu was that Bodhidharma rejected uh, the existing Buddhist establishment, the existing Buddhist establishment in China at the time, and said that these people are not practicing the true Dharma, and therefore he had to found a new school in order to introduce the correct Dharma. And so Bodhidharma's, uh, uh, well, there's there's no, <clears throat> there's nothing, no evidence that Bodhidharma actually uh, thought any such thing. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of Impo imposed on on him um, uh, by people who came much later, um, but Jing uh, Jing really did think that um, that the uh, existing Buddhist establishment was way off um, and needed to be replaced. Anyway, okay, so uh, let's see. Okay, this was a time of innovation and experimentation during which uh, Buddha. This is the most important thing that really happened during this time. Buddha went from being viewed by the Chinese as a foreign barbarian 
um, and he came to be seen as one of the three great sages. Uh, he took his place alongside uh, Confucius and Lao Tzu, um, and that's what happened during this time. Buddhism, Buddhism became, became uh, Chinese uh, uh, during this time, um, and as as part of this process, this, there's a tremendous, um, as part of the flourishing of the Dharma during this time, there was all kinds of innovation and experimentation, uh, people trying things, trying out ideas. And one of the ideas that, that many people tried out was that, hey, we are living in the Dharma ending age, <laughs> and therefore we have to fill in the blank. Um, uh, Sanjay Zhao was one of these experiments, uh, and actually for quite a while, it was a very successful experiment. However, by the 8th century, um, for reasons that are still far from clear, we'll t I'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, the, the movement was facing increasing hostility from the imperial government, and by the 10th century was mostly extinguished and remained largely forgotten until discovery a thousand years later. Of, of the school's apocryphal texts among the Dunhuang uh, manuscripts. <clears throat> and so in trying to figure out, okay, so that's kind of the historical background of the school. And we know that they had this idea that they were living in the Dharma ending age um, and that the only teachings that were appropriate were the teachings that were most suitable for the lowest quality uh, uh, practitioners. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but we have to be careful about uh, trying to pigeonhole different schools and leading figures um, uh, because, or as I, one way I put it is that the sticky notes we try to put on them keep falling off. Um, so just take, for example, a Zen, as everyone knows, totally rejects any reliance on the sutras. Everyone also knows that Zen was founded by Bodhidharma, who came to China from India carrying only three things with him, his robe, his bowl, and his copy of the Lankavatara Sutra, which was the basis for his teaching. Um, several generations later, the Lankavatara Sutra was no longer prominent in Zen teaching uh, by the time of the fifth ancestor, uh, Hung Ren. But Hung Ren had not done away with sutra study and sutra recitation and, and uh, uh, sutras. Uh, he'd simply replaced the Lankavatara with the Diamond Sutra. Um, and of course, as everybody knows, the Zen movement was very, very anti-establishment uh, and even iconoclastic. Uh, but actually, by the Sung dynasty, uh, the leading figures of the Zen school had themselves become the Buddhist establishment and remain so for the rest of up to up to this day in Chinese Buddhism. Um, and so that's just the Zen school. You could say similar things about attempts to uh, pigeonhole or put labels on the Pure Land schools, Hawaiian Buddhism, Tantai, Yogacara, and of course, Sanjay Zhao. So we have to be very careful about all attempts to um, oversimplify or um, or pigeonhole uh, Sanjay Zhao. Um, all attempts to nail them down. It's like trying to nail uh, jello to the wall. Doesn't work. Um, but one attempt to you know, really nail things down um, that did appear to stick for quite a while was the identification of Sanjay Zhao with Di Zong. Uh, and so this, the theory uh, that it, this was first proposed by a Japanese scholar, uh, I think his name is Yabuki Keiki. Um, I think I'm pronouncing that more or less right. Uh, in 1927, uh, this was when Japanese scholars were first, when maybe not first, but when they were really uh, starting to uh, process these uh, manuscripts that had been discovered in Dunhuang uh, in Central Asia. Uh, Yobuki showed that uh, Xing Jing, the founder of Sanjay Zhao, was greatly influenced by the scripture on the Ten Wheels, which does in fact very prominently feature uh, uh, Di Zong. Uh, he's the primary you know, actor in that in that scripture, um, and the, and in his own writings, not just in the scripture that he highly revered, but in Xing Jing's own writing, writings, he definitely talked a lot about Di Zong, and uh, held up Di Zong as a role model for practitioners. So this is uh, here's another typo. This is Jiru Ing's characterization of Yabuki Keiki's writings, um, but <clears throat> I think it's safe to say that this is accurate. That um, Jing Jing held up Dizong as a role model for practitioners. Um, and this is also from, from the evidence we have, from the archaeological evidence and from the historical uh, textual evidence, uh, this is during the, this period when the 
uh, Sanjay Zhao movement is coming into existence under Jing Jing's leadership. Uh, this is one of the first cultic beginnings that is stuff that we find texts and statues and pictures uh, related to the uh, to the cultic practices associated with Dizong. Uh, this is when we find them. Um, now, this strongly suggests that there is some sort of relationship between uh, Jing Jing and his uh, uh, Sanjay Zhao movement and the beginnings of uh, these uh, cultic uh, practices associated with Dizong. But Zhu Ying points out um, that uh, even though there's a correlation in time, this doesn't necessarily mean that there is a, a real causation. Um, and in fact, to the extent that they both occur at the same time, uh, which the historical evidence does indicate, the causation, if there is such, could be the other way around. There's no reason why uh, Sanjay Zhao couldn't have uh, uh, adopted uh, 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 Dizong uh, because that was already very popular with the very people that uh, Sanjay Zhao was trying to reach out to. Um, I'm not saying that's the case. Um, but uh, in fact, I think it's much safer to, to just stick with what uh, Zhu Ying uh, makes a case for, which is that there is no strong evidence that uh, uh, active cultic Dizong piety uh, had its origin in uh, Jing Jing's movement. Um, but and and as now it's it's worth talking a little bit about who Jing Jing was. Um, just briefly, um, he was raised a Buddhist. His mother, in fact, he was <laughs> he was conceived uh, after his mother had, had gone for a long time without being able to have children. Uh, and and uh, uh, his mother prayed to Kuan Yin for his son and became pregnant and, and had a child. He was very bright, but he wasn't particularly interested in Buddhism <laughs> when he was young. Uh, but uh, later in life, he became a fervent Buddhist practitioner, teacher, and a leader of this new movement. Um, uh, but what we know about uh, Ching Ching's life is is uh, it, it's often difficult to sort, you know, biography from hagiography. Um, uh, when it, for anybody who's become a, a leader of a, of a major Buddhist movement, and this is even more the case with someone who has become the leader of a major. Buddhist movement that later gets branded as a dangerous heresy, um, so that that muddies the water even more. Um, Okay, and then this is a repeat of, uh, of what I was saying before. So in in Jing Jing's teachings, his writings, the the three levels correspond to the three ages of the Dharma, uh, and Jing Jing firmly believed, as many Buddhists did at the time and still do today, that he was living in the third and final evil time of the Dharma ending age, uh, and. And during this time, the vast majority of people uh, are necessarily of the third lowest level, uh, those who have the least uh, capacity. Um, now, this word capacity, uh, uh, the, uh, there's an interesting uh, entry for it in the good old um, uh, digital dictionary of Buddhism online. You can look up uh, Buddhist terms by their Chinese characters um, there, and uh, it's the... Uh, this word that is usually translated in English as capacity, it uh, means the intellectual religious capacity of sentient beings, the ability to understand the profundities of the Buddhist doctrine and engage oneself in effective practices, generally categorized into sharp, average, and dull. <laughs> dull being, of course, the people that, uh, that the Sanjay Zhao movement was saying that's who the vast majority of us are, and that's what, what you know, we really need to be focused on. Um, the particular capabilities that a certain individual has for understanding a certain level of teaching and attaining enlightenment. Um, now, interestingly, you might think, well, what kind of, so if, if the vast majority of people are dull, have the lowest of, of all possible capacities, so what kind of practices are uh, most uh, appropriate for such people. Turns out, what what Jing Jing called formless meditation, which is very very similar to what Zen uh, uh, Zen meditation zazen, um, that's what Jing Jing said was the was the most appropriate practice for the 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 worst, the lowest, the dullest of us all. Um, uh, 
And in fact, Jing Jing, in, in the Chinese sources, he's referred to as a Chan master. Because um, in, in Chinese, Chan uh, just means meditation. Uh, and so anybody who teaches meditation and someone who is a very respected uh, teacher of meditation and considered to be an expert in meditation will just matter of factly be referred to as a Chan master, uh, a Zen master in, in Chinese. Um, and he was uh, generally recognized by people as a um, uh, as such, as, as a uh, expert teacher in meditation. Now, now, if uh, uh, there's there's a couple of sources that are really good, um, if you want to go find out more than you ever wanted to know about Sanjay Zhao, uh, and here I've got like a, a really long quote from a, a great uh, article that I think I'm going to try to find a link that I can that I can share um, uh, to this article. It's a book chapter, um, uh, but I'm just going to kind of read through this perhaps a little quickly. Um, uh, so, and, and so, and so, this so Mark Lewis uh, is starting out talking about uh, what what kind of so not everybody agreed back at the time of Xing Xing that they were all living in the Dharma ending age this time when the the Dharma had mostly been forgotten where the existing Buddhist institutions were mostly no good and. Uh, where most of the people were only of the lowest capacity. Uh, not everybody believed that, but some people did, and it wasn't just Xing Xing. So what Mark Lewis says is that in general, those who were devoted to philosophical speculation and intellectual synthesis tended to ignore or actively denied uh, this idea that the Dharma was disappearing. Um, but uh, people who did so what mark lewis calls it the disciplinary school this is what you'll often f see referred to as the vinaya school um you've have you encountered that terminology vinaya school so vinaya, vinaya school is, is kind of a strange uh designation uh, vinaya is the monastic code uh, of conduct it's the third basket or second basket depending upon the order that you put them in of the tripitaka it's just all the list of rules uh, that that monks and nuns are supposed to follow and the uh in correct interpretation of the rules uh and and any additional you know and like because because how the rules are enforced and all that stuff that's the way vinaya is usually thought of but um people who uh, specialize in vinaya actually are usually um specialists in conducting ceremonies and rituals uh, because one of the things that uh, is part of the training of monks and nuns in learning all the rules is how to conduct various uh, ceremonies and, and rituals. And so uh, often when the people who are in the Vinaya school, they're ceremonialists to some extent. Um, they're people who, who specialize in how to do weddings and funerals um, and uh, uh, stuff like that. Or at least that's one. Uh, I think I'm right about that. I have to, but and but I don't know why. Supposedly, people who were so, oh, also at this time in Chinese history, the the people in the Vinaya school tended to be um, not Mahayana Buddhists, or at least a lot of them were not yet. They had not. Um, uh, the, eventually, the Chinese Vinaya school became part of the Ma, Mahayana family. Uh, but this time, there was still a strong uh, non-Mahayana uh, uh, streak in Chinese Buddhism, uh, and it included uh, people in the Vinaya school. Um, also, the Pure Land sect uh, and Sanjay Zhao. So the, the Vinaya school, the Pure Land sect, and the Sanjay Zhao. Um, and I would put po quite possibly the, the early stages of the Zen school as well into this um, uh, group. They all spoke of the end of the Dharma, end of the Dharma as imminent or as an achieved fact. Um, uh, and so Lewis is saying these were the kind of the more non-intellectual, uh, non-philosophical, possibly not even very intelligent, I don't know what the implications of this phrasing is, um, but the people who are generally considered to be very advanced uh, and so this is it, 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 this kind of distinction. It can be really, really, really problematic, because one of the main people that um, uh, that Lewis puts in this category of 
leading philosophical thinkers of the period is GE. GE was the one, probably the greatest meditation practitioner and teacher in the history of Chinese Buddhism. Uh, when when Zen came along, shortly after GE, um, when when Zen teachers throughout the history of China have written meditation manuals, they've largely uh, they were at the very least largely inspired by Zhi's writings and often just copied him. Um, the only place where uh, the Zen school ever really clearly disagreed with any of Zhi's meditation teachings was that Zhi said you should keep your eyes closed when you meditate. <laughs> Other than that, Zhi's <laughs> meditation instructions are uh, they're usually more detailed and, and elaborate, and, and they do have quite a bit of philosophical um, uh, backing, um, but they're basically the same as uh, the kind of meditation instructions you'd get from any Zen teacher, other than um, whether you should keep your eyes open or closed. Um, but anyway, so uh, Lewis is creating this division between the more philosophical thinkers and the less philosophical people. Um, the less philosophical people rejected uh, you know, adopted this evil Dharma ending age uh, idea, and the more philosophical thinkers supposedly did not. Now, um, <clears throat> the single prominent exception uh, to this distinction um, is a very prominent exception, and it was good old uh, uh, Xuanzang. I mean, he spells using the older style of romanization, aka Xuanzang, and his cheap chief disciple, Kui Ji, Kui Ji um, they did believe that the imminent end of the Dharma and cited evidence for it in their writings. Um, and then he goes on to explain why he thinks that might have been the case. Uh, but it's <laughs> Now, one thing about this is that, um, and I don't, I probably won't have time to talk about this tonight, uh, Zhu Ying in her book also talks quite a bit about Kui Ji. Uh, she cites Kui Ji uh, at and she misleadingly, uh, and I, I will have to talk about this next time. Um, so, Zhu <clears throat> uh, Ying kind of misleadingly cites Kui Ji as an example of a Pure Land advocate who um, held that uh, Amitabha devotion, devotion to Amitabha, was superior to um, uh, devotion to Dizong. The problem with that is that in the same argument, what Kuiji is really arguing for is the superiority of Maitreya to everyone else. Um, <laughs> uh, so he's not really a pure land uh, 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 advocate, although Kuiji and uh, Xuanzang uh, were, so they were not sectarian pure land uh, Buddhists. They, they incorporated pure land teachings in their ideas. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide. Let's see. Oh, oh. In contrast with those of a philosophical bent, uh, men who advocated a restoration of discipline or a new religious praxis generally ar argued that the Dharma was on the brink of disappearing or had already done so. So what? Is, so this. So people, especially this, is very true of Xing Jing, uh, were prone to saying, "Oh, the monks these days, boy, they you know they don't follow the rules. They don't. Their robes aren't. I don't know what." They, <laughs> They're disheveled. They are loud. Um, they um, are undisciplined. Their practice is no good. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, Dharma, the, okay, these arguments clearly reflect his belief that the Dharma was in an advanced state of decay and that his ultimate disappearance was only a matter of time. Even more radical were those who proclaimed that the final age of the Dharma had already begun. So this is not a, this is a um, one of these Vinaya uh, teachers here that he's referring to here. The final age of the Dharma, or Mofa, uh, the most important of these were the Pure Land sect and the Three Stages sect. So they both uh, were, were teaching that the Mofa, the final Dharma ending age, uh, had been entered into. Um, and so... <clears throat> The, the the thing here is that in in both cases the Sanjay Zhao and the Pure Land schools were basically saying um, the situation of the Dharma is very 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 dire and therefore everyone should follow us <laughs> because that's the, that's your only hope um, uh, 
Yeah, and that's it's, uh, even in the twilight of Dharma, the Pure Land Stick still believes it. Could. So this is the thing, that uh, everybody who proclaims that the Dharma is ending, or sometimes they'll even go so far as to say that, you know, we've entered the absolute final stage, the MOFA, the final age of the Dharma. There's always, you know, the glimmer of hope that's held out that if you do follow my teaching, then the Dharma can be saved. Um but otherwise, the Dharma is lost. Uh, okay, now, let's see the corner. So, the core of the doctrine. So, this is still from Mark Edward Lewis's The Suppress. So, Mark Edward, his article focuses on why and how was the Sanjay Jiao suppressed why did it disappear you know who, who, who did it fall or was it pushed um so it, it, it everybody agrees that it was pushed and sanjay Zhao didn't just kind of disappear sanjay Zhao was was actively um suppressed and let's see the core of the doctrine of the three stages sect was that the dharma declined through three stages we've already covered that and the descent of the dharma into its ter terminal stage invalidated all distinctions and judgments of value cut off from the dharma's truth men could no longer distinguish right from wrong and so to avoid the crime of slander and false judgments they had no choice but to affirm and reverence all beings on the basis of their ultimate buddhahood so this is really an interesting teaching and um, <clears throat> this teaching is is obviously, uh, it, at least in part, inspired by the um, uh, chapter of the Lotus Sutra about the great um, Bodhisattva never disparaging, who was one of the previous incarnations of uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, um, whose practice was to never disparage and to simply recognize the Buddha nature in all beings, even though he lived during a time when people were very, 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 very bad. Um, and all the bad people who lived at that time, when Bodhisattva never disparaging lived, they, they would attack Bodhisattva never disparaging. They would beat him up. They would uh, beat him with sticks. They would throw rocks at him. And he would always just bow to them and say, I dare not disparage you, for you are all bodhisattvas, and you are all certain to become Buddhas. And all those people were, uh, so uh, that, that bodhisattva was later to be reborn as Siddhartha and to become uh, Shakyamuni Buddha. And all those people who were throwing rocks at him uh, became his disciples um, uh, during his uh, 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 career as Shakyamuni Buddha. Um, let's see. And so the idea of universal Buddhahood, uh, universal Dharma, universal reverence, so universal, uh, the Sanjay Jiao, one of the buzzwords for Sanjay Jiao was universal. Everything is universal. Um, universal truth, universal common man, um, and uh, which, you know, it all, it, that sounds good. And actually a lot of the stuff about Sanjay Jiao sounds very good, especially when you combine it with um, uh, their anti-establishment rhetoric. Um, so modern people who are looking for kind of more politically correct looking uh, sort of models for Buddhism uh, can have a tendency to glom on to um, the Sanjay Jiao movement and say, oh, these people look good. Uh, you know, it, we have to be, you have to be a little careful uh, about that though, because at the same time, the, the logic of their rhetoric is everyone's wrong except for us and your only hope is to follow us. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's a very kind of dangerous sort of teaching. Um, although a lot of the specifics sound pretty good. Um, the relation of the Buddha nature to sentient creatures was variously compared to that of water, to waves, clay or metal, and to the impediments made from them or an actor to the many roles he plays. For the true nature of all those beings were not yet Buddhas, was actually the same as that of the Buddha himself. Since all beings shared the Buddha nature, all were truth Buddhas. All were in truth Buddhas. That sounds good. Um, okay, and so this is this is more. Uh, yeah, and and this is uh, so uh, Edward says specifically um, 
talk about how they adopted as their role model the Bodhisattva, never disparaging, described in the Lotus Sutra, who bowed to everything he encountered and proclaimed his future Buddhahood. It also led them to denounce all those who uniquely reverenced the Buddhas, the Sangha. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is good, but then they, they, they model themselves on Bodhisattva, never disparaging, but then they immediately turn around and start denouncing everyone who doesn't follow their interpretation of Bodhisattva, never disparaging. Um, <clears throat> anyway, all right. So this is so this is the book that this article is contained in, and I I do have it. This is a very 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 interesting book in itself. Um, I I have a copy of of this article that I, I'm going to try to share with people. Um, okay, so I just want to spend a few more minutes. Oh yeah, we're we're very very close to being out of time. Uh, so I, it. Are there uh, questions about anything that I've talked about so far? Um, you know, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm very interested in Chinese history. Uh, I'm also really interested in heretical ideas in general. Um, <laughs> not just heretical Buddhist ideas, but, you know. Uh, so this, this really pushes a lot of my buttons and, and, and draws me in. Um, but it's, it's something that the Juru Ng just kind of assumes and, and doesn't really go into and, and give much explanation of. So um, that's what I'm using as my justification for going on about Sanjay Jiao. It's a really fascinating subject. Um, and, and kind of, and it, and it comes from a really important uh, turning point in the history of Chinese Buddhism as a whole. Um, this, like I said, this comes at the same time when Xuanzang wrote the Heart Sutra, when Ji Yi wrote the Four Great Vows, when Bodhidharma had his encounter with um, the Emperor Wu of Liang. Uh, uh, all this was happening within within a course of a, of a few decades um, in China. So it's uh, a lot of stuff was happening, and this was part of it. Uh, and Pure Land Buddhism was coming into it, its own in, in Chinese Buddhism as well at the time. Um, so uh, this last part is um, uh, Edwards going into more about exactly, you know, the, the main thing that Edwards is saying is that uh, Sanjay Zhao, where they really got into trouble, was in their undermining of the official Buddhist hierarchy and especially the the, the monastic hierarchy, um, and this this really got them into a conflict with three emperors in particular who themselves were very devout Buddhists, and because of their personal interest in Buddhism, they took Sanjay Zhao's teachings more personally than other emperors. Other emperors, it was the official policy in the Sui and the Tang dynasties to support Buddhism, but most of the emperors just treated that as nothing more than the official policy. And they didn't really get their hands dirty, uh, mixing it up and saying, you know, trying to uh, sort out doctrinal differences or, um, or you know, being too involved in appointing who is in charge of what within the, the Buddhist uh, institutions. But three emperors in particular did, including the famous Emperor Wu, often referred to as Empress Wu, uh, the only uh, woman to ever be Emperor of China. Um, in Chinese, there is no, the word Empress doesn't exist in, in Chinese. It's the same word, whether you're a man or a woman. And it's it didn't come up except for that one time <laughs> when when uh, Wu, when Emperor Wu was was the emperor, um, but she was a very devout Buddhist. Um, one of the emperors during the uh, Sui Dynasty, and then a, a later emperor after um, after Wu, uh, I've got his name here somewhere. But they were the ones who suppressed Sanjay Zhao because uh, they didn't like uh, what Sanjay Zhao was doing. They were they involved themselves directly in the, you know. Uh, in, in Buddhism, uh, and, and, you know, as as an ex as a religious institution in China, whereas other emperors emperors didn't bother themselves with that so much. But these three emperors were the ones who um, took it personally and um, took took measures to um, suppress uh, Sanjay Zhao. And if you really want to, you know, even more, there's a whole book about it by a guy named Jamie Hubbard. This is a very interesting book that I've only just barely gleaned. Um, there is a um, an article that uh, uh, Hubbard has online um, that there's a link to here. And this is just a, 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 a quote 
Um, there is no question that the official hostility toward Xingxing, this is another way of writing Xingxing's name, teachings and institutions is the most conspicuous aspect of their history. Although Xingxing advocated no revolution, led no peasant mobs in uprising, and left behind no track record of immoral behavior by his community, within six years of his death in 594, the propagation of his text was prohibited, and over the next 125 years, Four more edicts were issued banning various um, aspects of his followers' practice and organization. Um, it, it's important to note that during this time, during this 125-year period, this is when Sanjay Zhao was at its height in terms of numbers of adherents, numbers of temples, uh, numbers, you know, it, it was very influential during this time, uh, which is another which is another way to get people's attention and to make people you know look more closely at what you're doing is to be successful. That's probably another reason why they were suppressed uh, when they were not quite as um, well known or successful. They could be more easily ignored, um, and. Uh, Part and parcel of the same program, his writings were declared heretical and banished from the canon as spurious. And this is among the few uh, scriptures so designated for reasons other than false. At, at, so th in, uh, sometimes Buddhist scholars back in the day, um, not modern Buddhist scholars, but these were Buddhist Buddhist scholars in China. Um, they would say, is this sutra really a sutra or is this, or did someone just make this up and write this and is trying to pass it off as a sutra? So they would have um, discussions like this, but usually it was not for p political or um, just because they didn't like what the sutra said. Um, this is one of the cases where that was the case, where, where these writings in particular were um, uh, labeled as spurious because uh, the emperor and people working for the emperor um, didn't like it. Uh, and uh, having gradually passed out of circulation, their rediscovery in a cave in the central Asian oasis town a century ago was a momentous occasion, blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of, a, it's, an, it's also an interesting story of things that were lost and then found later again. Okay, so uh, I think I might have gone over a little over time. Uh, any any final thoughts or questions or uh, complaints or um, suggestions? Very interesting. I think it is, and I you know so I'm I'm I was a little frustrated you know that Juring didn't tell us more about Sanjay Zhao, but uh, I found it very interesting to kind of dig it up on my own. I have a question. Yeah. Go um, are you saying that Emperor Wu from the Bodhi Dharma Exchange was a woman? Mm. Different Emperor Wu. So, oh, okay. so, so that was so Emperor Wu of Liang. It's important. So, so yeah. So Wu is a fairly common Chinese name. Emperor Wu of Liang was definitely well, as far as I know, um, definitely a man. Um, and uh, Emperor Wu, so usually referred to as Wu Zetian. And so, and I mean, I, I was kind of being cute and insisting on referring to her as Emperor Wu, uh, because people usually refer to her as Empress Wu. Um, but like I said, in China, there is there is no word for female emperor. Because the word for emperor doesn't mean male emperor, it just means emperor it has no gender to it. Yeah. So no, I wasn't saying that. Different, different Emperor Wu. There's, there's probably five or six or seven or more Emperor Wu's in the history of China. Uh, how many generations between those two? Um, maybe. Uh, so, is she, a hundred years, maybe a hundred twenty-five years. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. She played a really important role in uh, how how Buddhism in general uh, developed uh, in China uh, because she was a Buddhist and very interested in Buddhism and also because uh, uh, she was supported by Buddhists. You know, there had never been, so Confucianists, for Confucianists, for especially for the kind of hidebound, straight-laced Confucianists who would hang out at the court um, the idea of a woman sitting on the throne was unacceptable. Um, but she was a very strong supporter of Buddhism, and the Buddhists supported her as emperor. She was very strong and successful emperor. Well, that's, 
evaluating anybody's rule reign as emperor is always very touchy. Okay. I'm going to put up the four great vows now, and we will recite that uh, to um, end. Oh, come on. There it is. Of course, I had a software update that I had to apply to my computer like half an hour before the class started, so I don't have didn't have the file up. All right, so I'm going to share my screen again. We will recite the four vows um, to end. Sentient beings are numberless. We vow to save them all. Delusions are endless. We vow to cut through them all. The teachings are infinite. We vow to learn them all. The Buddha way is inconceivable. We vow to attain it. May whatever excellent qualities we have gained from this practice be extended for the benefit of all beings. Thanks so much for coming, everybody. Elizabeth. Thank you. Great to see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.